In today's video, we're going to be putting together an all Intel budget gaming PC, something that a couple of years ago you couldn't actually do. And there was two reasons for that. The first reason was because Intel were not that well known for their budget components, particularly when it came to price to performance. They were more the kind of high end stuff that people wanted. The second reason was because they didn't actually produce graphics cards. But now that they do, it gives us a great opportunity to put all Intel systems together and see what you get for your money. Now, before we start actually going through the parts, there's a little disclaimer in this video. The system that we're actually putting together now is not Intel's latest generation, but it is on their latest platform. Everything that you can actually see here, you can still buy it brand new. But I think that going a couple of generations older on things actually provides a better price to performance. For the CPU, we're going to be using this. This is the Intel Core i3-12100F. This is a four core, eight thread processor. So yes, it is a quad core processor in 2024, but don't let that fool you because Intel made massive leaps in terms of a single core performance when they actually moved to the 12th generation. And what this CPU lacks in cores really makes up when it comes to speed. These little i3 processors won't cost you that much anymore, around £90. So that's not actually that bad for any kind of processor, particularly one as fast as this. For the motherboard, we have gone with this MSI Pro H610ME. This is a micro ATX board and they don't cost that much at all, but it will offer everything that we need. It is again a slightly later Later generation this would have been one of the first boards that came out with the 12th generation but it will actually support a lot more than that it will clearly support everything that we're building in it today it does come as a ddr4 board so we can save a little bit of money just going ddr4 instead of ddr5 and that is probably one of the biggest bonuses of going intel at the moment because you have a lot more options over the amd counterparts which only support ddr5 this board actually supports two ddr slots as well as an nvme slot so we can keep things low key and keep our cable management down for the memory we've gone with something pretty basic and it's in the form of these two sticks here this is Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro. It's actually pretty cheap nowadays. And we've got two sticks of eight. So we're going to be running a dual channel 16 gigabytes. This will actually work pretty flawlessly now. DDR4 is very, very stable. So you won't have any issues there installing it into the board. For storage, we're going to go with a very basic Crucial Drive. This is a Crucial P2 500 gigabyte NVMe. You can pick these up super cheap nowadays. Crucial are continuously having deals on them, but you could probably get an even faster one of these. As with most of the parts we're using here today, you can actually swap lots of different things out. You don't have to buy a Crucial Drive. You don't have to buy Corsair Vengeance memory. You can pretty much buy whatever brand you want. And you can usually get some of those lower brands even cheaper. But for today, that's what we're going to be using. That's going to be more than enough to install that operating system as well as a few games. And we can always expand the storage later because of course, the board also supports many different SATA drives. To build a gaming PC, of course, you need a graphics card. And for that, we have gone with this ASRock Challenger ITX Intel Arc A380. Now, at the end of last year, we actually did give one of these away, but I couldn't have an incomplete collection. So I actually purchased another. And it was great because it obviously meant that we could do this build too. These little cards are obviously not the most powerful cards you can get from Intel or any brand, to be honest but they will actually game and they've been getting better over time. Intel obviously had issues when they first released their graphics cards, particularly with drivers, but nowadays they've actually cleaned it all up. They're pretty stable and they will pretty much support and play any game that you want. Obviously, pairing up with this CPU, we're going to see what kind of a combination we can get running here, particularly when it comes to performance of lower tier products. But I think this card will work out perfectly fine in the build. For the power supply, you don't need a lot for this kind of build. I would actually roughly spend around £50 on this and look for something that's around a 550 watt. You don't need any more than that for the graphics card and the CPU combination, and it leaves you a little room to be able to get something later on. The one that I'm going to be using today is this Fractal Design Ion. It is a 560 watt. I really wouldn't purchase one of these if you are building a budget system. These are actually quite expensive because they are platinum rated, but this is the only one that I've got available in the studio at the moment. So we're going to be building with this and it just gives us an opportunity to test everything. Now to house all of these components, we of course need a case. And for that, I've picked this. Now this is probably one of the most cutest cases that I've ever seen. And it is from Techware. It is the Techware Nexus Air M2, which means it does come with full ventilation at the front as well as one of the coolest features that I've seen on cases for a while, and that is the swinging door. You don't have any screws to actually be able to open this case. All you need to do is just pull it from the bottom here and you can swing the door open and closed. That actually gives you great opportunities for getting into your system and cleaning out the dust without actually taking things apart. 
These cases won't cost you that much at all and they provide excellent airflow throughout. As standard, they come with three 120mm fans which can either be connected to Molex giving you 100% speed or you can connect them to a 3-pin VC header on the motherboard and then they will actually all be controlled by the motherboard software itself. That actually makes this case reasonably good when it comes to the price because you don't actually pay a lot for these. It was only around £35 and they're constantly going on sale. I just think that the size of this case actually is pretty cute to be honest. It's near enough the size of something like the NZXT H210 which is an ITX case. So I don't understand why people would be buying them and spending even more on ITX components where you can get away with a much cheaper micro ATX system in one of these. Now we know it's not cheap to build gaming PCs at the moment and it hasn't actually been for a while. I don't see it getting any better. So this is probably one of the lowest things that you probably should be building new today. But as total cost goes for the CPU, we've obviously paid around £90. You can pick them up from anywhere for that kind of price. For the motherboard, you will pay around £85. For RAM, we spent £30. Now you can pick up any kind of brand of RAM for 30 pounds now a day particularly if you're just looking at 16 gigabytes to 8 gigabyte sticks so that's not too bad and you can even find it cheaper if you hunt around for the ssd we paid 30 pounds that's not bad again for a 500 gigabytes but sometimes you can get them on deals where you can get even one terabyte for that kind of price so again it's worth hunting around but that's what we paid for this one for the power supply obviously the one that we're using today doesn't cost 50 pounds but i would actually reserve around 50 pounds for this build you can actually purchase lower tier power supplies from people like evga for around 50 pounds and you'll even get things that are 600 to 750 watts so i would actually look at those kind of options because obviously it's going to give you a lot more future proofing for the case we paid at 35 pounds and that's not too bad for any kind of case particularly for one that i think is this cool and then for the graphics card they roughly cost around 130 all in all that brings a total to 450 pounds that's not great in terms of what we historically used to be able to build gaming pcs for but in today's market, it's actually a pretty cheap system. Now, the system that we are building may be cheap, but how well will it perform? Well, the only way we can find that out is obviously put the system together and play some games. So we've got the system built and to be honest it wasn't that difficult at all it's a very very easy system to put together and i think it looks absolutely cute this little adorable case actually houses everything perfectly fine it really has some nice filled out space there's no big issues anywhere you can always upgrade this you can get a longer graphics card in and all that kind of stuff so i'm pretty impressed with the build overall but of course we want to see how well it performs when it comes to gaming how well can an intel or a budget intel gaming system perform in 2024 well let's get an operating system installed let's get some games on there and give them a go Okay, so we got everything installed and the system runs beautifully, to be honest. These 12th gen and up Intel CPUs really do provide a snappy experience when it comes to Windows. Now, the first game that we're going to try really is something a little bit easy for this system, just to warm it up a little bit and we'll see how well it performs in that. Now, this is Back for Blood, one of my favourite games. I do keep coming back to this game and playing it over and over and the game was actually designed for that. But before we head out into the danger, what I'll do is I'll go and double check the settings. We'll go to our options and graphics here. We are currently running in a 1080p resolution, which we're going to stick to for all of this testing because this is a budget machine after all. We've pretty much got everything turned on. There's a mixture of things here. We are in a quality setting of high and there is no assistance. 
not from what I can see from any kind of upscaling technology. Heading back into the game, we can see that we're currently getting an average now of 65 frames per second, 64 frames per second, but it is floating around a bit and we're not really got that much on screen. We'll get down into a bit of a fight and we'll go through this gate here where there's going to be lots of zombies for us to kill. We'll just uh, open it up now and we'll see what our uh, performance starts looking like. It's increased slightly as we got down there, but obviously with more happening on the screen, we can see that it's dipping slightly now in the 60s, but as long as we can get over 60 FPS, we're pretty much happy here. The 1% lows are not looking as good, I will admit. They are currently running at around 37 FPS, but to be honest, the game is reasonably smooth. There's no stuttering or jerkiness at all. I think this is quite playable so far, but we'll try and get a bit of a horde going on here to see what happens when there's a lot more on the screen. Now the system is holding up pretty well at the moment. We did see a slight dip there to uh, 58 frames per second, but generally it is around that 60. If we wanted to increase the performance here, we could go to our options. We'll probably die while we're doing this because the game doesn't pause and we'll reduce the quality setting to a medium setting. We'll see what kind of performance we get with that. Now, as we can see, we instantly had a bit of a jump up here in terms of graphic quality, there isn't that much of a difference to be honest. I don't tend to find as much between a high and a medium setting, particularly for fast paced games like this, but we have increased our average FPS now to 77, 78. So I would say that this game is more than playable on this system and you're gonna have a good experience with that. Now, of course the system played Back for Blood perfectly fine. There was absolutely no issues. So we're gonna load up another game. The game that we're loading up is of course Hogwarts Legacy. That is another game that I actually quite enjoy playing and I'm still kind of going through it on my main system to be honest so it gives me a good reference for when I test systems like this but as you can tell when we come to doing things like preparing shaders which this game does this is where the i3 is actually going to fall over a little bit it means you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to do that kind of work so those four cores and eight threads are kind of working their way itself away but obviously if you had something bigger this would be a much faster process one eternity later now Hogwarts Legacy is a much more demanding title than Back for Blood so here we're really going to be testing the CPU more than anything because it is a big open world game but i kind of have a feeling that this little intel art graphics card is going to be the one that really lets us down here they are not the fastest cards and with only six gigabytes of vram we're going to be limited on the kind of texture packs and things that we've got but if we jump straight into game we can see that we've currently got an average of 37 frames per second with a one percent low of 29 that is not brilliant for a new system but of course we are on a budget system here but We'll head over to the settings and we'll see what we have actually got configured. If we go to our display settings, we can see that we're in a 1080p. We currently have AMD FSR 2 also enabled. We want to turn that off for now. So we've got a rendering resolution of the native 1080p. VSync is turned off. Our frame rate is uncapped. I've turned off film grain, chromatic abbreviation and motion blur. I don't like those kind of things. And I don't play with them at all, so this really does give us a pure test against other things that I've tested. And then if we go to settings, we're currently set to ultra. We're going to drop that down to a high setting. We'll apply those settings and we'll see what it actually looks like now. Jumping back into game, we can see that we've not actually improved anything at all. And it's probably because we did actually... And whoops, there we can actually find one of our first issues with this kind of system. The game actually crashed. We didn't actually get any warnings or nothing like that. The game just simply just disappeared. So if you are going to be to building a system like this with a budget kind of Intel kind of thing, you are really stepping into the unknown here because of course the Intel Art graphics cards have got much better over time but there are still issues here and there i'm not exactly sure what caused our crash here but i don't think i'm going to actually try hogwarts legacy again what we're going to do is we're going to try something else now while we're actually loading this game up as you can see it's a sony title we're going to try something slightly modern but easy enough to play it should really demonstrate what this kind of system is capable of now straight away we can see that we're getting an average of 56 fps with a one percent low of 36 that means that the game is should be more than playable and reasonably smooth but We'll head over into the settings and we'll see what we're actually configured to. Go into our settings, display and graphics. We are currently running in 1080p with no help from any kind of upscaling methodology. We do have access to some of them in this game. If we go to our graphics, we're currently running in high. I want to actually just drop that down to medium just so we can have a bit of a boost in our performance. Let's see if we can get that 60 FPS and as high a 1% low as we can. We'll head back into the game. We are now getting an average of 60 FPS. We do seem to be locked again, but we're getting a bit of stuttering here and there, which has really dropped our 1% lows down to about 6 FPS now. That's not great again. We're probably running out of steam here on the graphics card again, but it is a budget graphics card from Intel, and this is the kind of thing you expect with it, to be honest. 
but everything is starting to smoothen out we're getting no issues right now even though we are pretty low to the ground which is where this game really does add demand to a system we're still getting an average of 59 frames per second and our one percent lower has really increased now since that jump to around 36 38 now so in the 30s you are going to get a reasonably smooth gameplay to be honest but let's get up nice and high and see what happens to the fps when we can see the whole city we'll just run up this building here we'll jump up so we had a little bit of a dip there to around 56 frames per second but it's gone back up now to 60 so our average at the moment is around 59 with a one percent low of 40. i'm just going to head back into the settings now see if there's anything that we can do about that because we are living in 2024 now so we've got extra tools and things that we can really enable to help us out here we do have access to xess now xess is intel's version of fsr or dlss it should allow the system to render the game at different resolutions to increase our performance i don't really use this often i've not really given it any kind of in-depth testing so i'm not sure what exactly what's going to happen here so let's enable it and see what happens it to be honest it hasn't greatly improved anything it hasn't actually degraded the quality of the game or at least the picture quality at all from what i can see i'm not even sure that it's done anything at all really because our performance is exactly the same so I suppose the one other thing that we can try to try and really boost that 1% low up is enable a different type of upscaling. So we'll go ahead over back to our graphics and instead we'll enable FSR 2.1. Now this is currently set to an upscaling quality of dynamic and we'll see what actually happens when we do that. Now with FSR 2.1 enabled, again, we don't seem to have any kind of difference here with our performance. We're still getting an average of around 51 frames per second and that increases as we move around the city. But our 1% low is continuing to remain at around 37 and 38. So I think for this type of system, in this type of game, this is the kind of quality and performance that you're going to get. So this is a budget system that is completely Intel. It's the first time we've ever been able to build a system like this in many, many years because they didn't produce graphics cards and didn't really have a budget offering. If we look at the stats when, while we're playing these games, we can clearly see that our bottleneck is actually this graphics card. The CPU itself is perfectly happy doing all this kind of stuff. If we were to increase the graphics card in here, we'd get a lot more performance out of it without even touching the CPU. So unfortunately, it is the graphics card here that is causing us issues. It could be a lot of driver issues still from Intel. They are still having some kind of issues, even though it, they've improved greatly since they actually released them. Or it could be that this graphics card is just the lowest range, and this is the kind of thing that you expect. It is a bit strange that in 2024, even on a budget system, we are still looking at trying to target 1080p 60 fps we should be trying to target even more than that now even with a budget system to be honest if you were paying the price of this card which was around 130 pounds about four or five years ago you were getting cards from amd that would actually nearly outperform this card even now but they would easily be able to you know kind of hit that 1080p 60 as well so it seems that we haven't really moved on particularly when we start to build a system that is all intel but this is where we are in the marketplace today. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the system. Would you build anything like this or would you just go to the pre-owned market and build even better? On the pre-owned market, you can build a much better system than this, pretty much at the same price and you would get a lot more performance out of it. It is good to actually see what Intel can produce at this kind of range because at the moment, the other brands are not really kind of targeting this kind of level. If you look at your AMD graphics cards at the moment, I think the cheapest one that you can buy is the RX 7600, particularly on their new generation. And that's going to cost you two to three hundred pounds. So that's pretty much near enough to the cost of the system anyway. And then obviously on the Nvidia side, they're not even bothering with that kind of uh, level kind of cards. I think the closest you're going to get is something like the RTX 3050, which again is still 200 plus. So you're not really going to be able to build a full system out of that, particularly for this kind of price point. But anyway, make sure you subscribe to the channel to see more videos coming up. We've got a lot more builds going forward. We really want to kind of see what intel can do if you go for an all intel system so we're going to be doing a build around that we've also got some builds coming up around the latest platforms from amd so you won't want to miss it make sure you hit that subscribe and i'm sure as always i'll catch you guys in the next one